All right, hello, welcome. It's really excellent to see so many of you here. I think we only have like two empty seats with a view of the screen, so that's pretty awesome. Thanks so much for coming, even though the weather is nice, as you said, so <laughs> that's, that's a hard, hard thing to compete with up here. I'm, I'm from fr Finland originally, and I really love how there are some commonalities with everyone who lives in cold climates. So after you have that one warm day, people just refuse to acknowledge that it's cold again, and they're walking around in shorts. It's like, no, it's like winter is over. I do not accept this cold weather. <laughs> it is summer now. It's just uh, fun. Uh, anyway, so uh, today we're going to have a little live coding adventure. We're going to learn about building AI-powered applications. How many of you have built an AI-powered application of some sort? Dan, for sure. All right, we have like three, four people here. Very good. Um, hopefully by the end of today, you'll all have kind of a basic understanding of what goes into doing so if you would like to do one. Uh, yourself. Uh, really my intent here is to just spark curiosity and hopefully make this whole AI thing seem a little bit less scary as a subject to kind of approach. Uh, I am, as a human being, a fairly curious person, so when AI things started becoming more mainstream here a couple of years ago, I immediately started tinkering around with them. I, I know you, Dan, mentioned on the way over here that you Actually, uh, you were working with AI already in the 90s, okay. so... That shows age. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, I, I, so if you have like really tough questions, I, I really hope that you can ask Dan and just, uh, just save all the really easy ones for me. <laughs> anyway, um, so I was really curious about just kind of playing around with these tools and seeing like how can I use them for something that's interesting to me, because I think there's a tremendous value that AI can bring us if it's used correctly. This here is my dog Nova. Nova is 11 years old, so she's an old lady in dog years. And as an old lady, she has some aches and pains as we all start getting when we get old. So a couple of months ago, we had to take her in to a vet for a CT scan just to make sure that there wasn't anything wrong with her uh, back. And uh, they did the scan and the radiologist in his infinite vis wisdom, just printed out the report, which was a dense letter-sized thing of medical jargon, plopped it on a uh, table, took a picture with a cell phone, and just sent it as a text message with no explanation. And we're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so we're like, is this good or bad? Is she dying? Is she OK? Anything in between? So like, as a nerd, I'm like, all right, well, ChatGPT, now it's your time to shine. <laughs> <laughs> so I uploaded it there. I instructed ChatGPT that, hey, you're now a radiologist. Not only that, you're capable of communicating with human beings. <laughs> so can you please read through this report and just summarize the key findings and easy to understand English? Sure enough, I got like three topics with a couple of bullet points saying like, here's what's going on, this and that. And just like, turns out she's just an old, old dog. Nothing to worry about. There are some aches and pains, but that's kind of part of the equation when you're that old. So that just kind of allowed us to relax. Sure enough, he did call four hours later and told us the same thing, but like that's four hours of worrying we didn't have to go through. So I think there's just a tremendous amount of good stuff that we could do as humans with AI if it's used properly. But also if you've used ChatGBT or Gemini or any other model, on its own, like sometimes you're like, well, why is it so stupid? Like this is a seemingly very simple thing. Like why doesn't it understand what I'm trying to do? Now on a high level, a large language model is pretty straightforward. You ask it a question, in the middle there's like magic and unicorns and stuff happening, and then you get an answer. And the problem really comes in when we start doing something that's more specific to our interests or our business, because the LLMs are fairly generic in in their training data and what they're capable of, whereas what we're trying to do in our business or our hobby project or whatever we're interested in is usually very bound to a specific context that we're interested in. So there's like this mismatch going on. Now, I work for a company called Vaadin, and we provide open source libraries for Java developers to build web applications. Specifically, we help 
companies build more of the kind of business applications, if you will. So these are the really data heavy apps with grids and forms and charts and lots of business rules and stuff like not the cool apps that are on app stores, but the ones that are actually like generating billions of dollars in the back of the house at companies. And what I've seen from working with customers is that there's just a tremendous amount of very inefficient workflows happening within these companies where I think AI could really help people be more productive and like there are people who are sitting in cubicles or maybe home in sweatpants these days but still like clicking around eight hours a day doing some like very mindless task of moving things between things or stuff that I think we could better have an AI do and then we just kind of supervise that that thing got done correctly than having people spend their day doing that kind of stuff. So that got me on a quest to like understanding like how can we improve the situation? How can I help our customers build better software? And obviously I'm a Java developer, so I wanted to do this in Java. I know Python well enough to do stuff with it, but all of my customers are using Java. I like using Java, so I wanted to do it in Java. One way of kind of looking at the whole equation of like building an AI powered app that I found useful for myself and maybe useful for you as well is uh, this uh, architecture diagram by Andre Karpathy. He's one of the guys at OpenAI and he kind of likened the architecture of an AI powered application to a kind of a computer diagram where you have the LLM as the CPU. So it's kind of the brains of the operation, but in and of itself, you don't do a whole lot with just the CPU if you don't have anything to kind of uh, give it. So at a very minimum, we want to have some sort of working memory that we, we can use when we're uh, working with the LLM. So that in our case is a context window. We at some very kind of early stage, uh, if we want to do something that's more specific to our interests, want to probably have some sort of persistent storage as well where we can store stuff that we can easily retrieve whenever we need to do something more specific, kind of pull more information into the equation we probably want to give it some tools where we can defer some stuff, tasks to the AI and let it handle some simple things for us so we don't have to do every single step ourselves. Likewise, we might want to call other LLMs so different models are trained on different tasks. Uh, we might have one that's really good at generating images and other ones that's really good at understanding text and uh, whatever else we might have. So it's really kind of helpful to understand that the LLM in itself doesn't need to be the one that does every single thing by itself, but it's more of a CPU in, in this equation. Now, I'm not a data scientist or AI uh, expert on that level. Like, I have a passing understanding of how neural networks work and how they're trained and all of that, but we're not going to do a lot of math today. We're going to look at AIs through a language that we all understand as developers, APIs. So we don't really care how the sausage gets made as long as it's really tasty and uh, good. We're happy with it. The two uh, kind of tools that we're going to be working with today are one, langchain for j So this is a Java library for working with AI tools like, uh, like models. So it gives us a lot of tools that allow us to work on a higher level of abstraction than just straight up working with the REST APIs and counting tokens and doing things ourselves. And, and we're going to really see this when we get to the kind of coding part of the thing where if you've ever tried to build an app without a tool like this, you, you'll see like all the things that we don't need to do. The other tool that we're going to use is our framework called Hilla, and that's a full stack framework that allows us to build a React UI uh, that connects type safely to a Spring Boot backend. So we're going to use that just for generating a UI where we can see live both the kind of interaction with the LLM and how it's affecting our database. The way I'm going to structure this discussion is along a kind of spectrum of, uh, or kind of a line of agent autonomy. I pulled this off of the Microsoft Semantic Kernel documentation site. I had initially done a really fun meme version of this that I came up with on a bike ride, but then I found that there's like a more proper thing that seemed a lot more professional than my <laughs> expanding mind meme. So we're going to go with this one. So at the kind of least amount of autonomy uh, end of the spectrum here, we have a chat bot. So this is kind of your original chat GPT where you can 
chat with it. It knows whatever it's trained on. It doesn't really have access to any other information. Uh, you can get really helpful uh, answers about things that it knows, get very good bullshit about things that it doesn't know, but that's pretty much it. If you want to do something that's more specific to your interests or your business context or whatever, you typically will end up doing at least retrieval, augmented generation, or rag that it's kind of started becoming called here in the uh, past year or so. So this means that we retrieve some specific information that we know is going to be kind of pertinent to answering the specific question that we're about to ask. So we're essentially giving the LLM an open textbook question. So we tell it to like, hey, go answer this. Here's the right book, open on the right page and read this and then answer the question. And that just radically improves the performance when you're talking about something that the LLM wasn't trained on. Now we can take things one step further and go to a co-pilot mode where essentially we still sit very firmly in the driver's seat, but we allow the AI to perform some tasks for us that we define that it's okay to do. So in our case, we're gonna define some methods that we're comfortable with the AI performing for us, uh, but we're still kind of uh, very much in the driver's seat here. We're not gonna go today all the way to the fully autonomous part of the spectrum here where essentially the AI just figures out on its own how to do things and what to do and then just goes ahead and does them. So uh, the reason is that I think when we're talking about say business applications, I think we're still a little ways away from a place where we're really comfortable giving all the autonomy away from us. Like we still wanna have some level of control over the system so we're not comfortable just saying like hey go and do my taxes and hope that it maybe <laughs> happened to go right um, so so we're going to look at the kind of first uh, three stages here and I we're going to kind of go through them first uh, just briefly on a theoretical level because uh, the vast majority of you guys here hadn't built an app before I want to make sure that we're all kind of on the same level of understanding before we get to the code because it's going to make a whole lot more sense when we get there so if we start at the kind of bottom end of the uh, spectrum here and the chatbot, so essentially now we're talking about having our LLM and just a context window, nothing really else hooked up to that. Uh, the context window is something that's worth understanding. So this is again, kind of the working memory that we have when we're conversing with a language model. Uh, context windows uh, are kind of measured in tokens. Tokens are these kind of uh, sub words that the LLM splits text into when it analyzes it. So r roughly say if we had hypothetically a 4,000 token window, that would be at roughly 3,000 words of English language, give or take, depending on the model and, and all kinds of things. What's more important to understand though is what you wanna fit into that con context window. So first of all, you wanna usually instruct your AI who it is and how it should behave and kind of give it some kind of ground rules, that's the system prompt. So in my case with my dog, this was me instructing the AI to be a radiologist that's capable of communicating with human beings, for instance. Then we need to track the history of our conversation because again, the generic LLM doesn't retain any memory of its own. So if we fail to send what we've been talking about earlier, it's not gonna know what we're talking about and we'll, we'll see how that works in in, in real life here. Obviously we wanna have our question that we send and most likely we wanna include some sort of relevant information that we know is gonna help, help that AI generate a helpful answer. It's also worth noting that you need to have enough room for the answer to get generated there. So if you have a 4,000 token window and you cram it full of data and send it over, you have zero tokens left for an answer to get generated and that's not gonna be super helpful. Now, these token windows have grown vastly in the past year. So we, maybe a year ago, like a four to 16,000 uh, token window was normal. Now we're talking about 200,000 to what Gemini 1.5 was a million and a half tokens now. So essentially you can theoretically start putting almost anything you want into that uh, context window. It's still worth noting that at least most APIs that I know of are charging by the amount of tokens that you use. So you have still a kind of built-in incentive to not use more tokens that you need at any given time. 
uh, if you don't have like a particular use case uh, for that. OK, so that's kind of just the very basics, just understanding like how do we talk to an LLM and maintain the memory. So if we then want to kind of teach it something more about our context, so add some sort of persistent storage to our, to our uh, chart here, it's good to understand what uh, large language models know and what they don't know. So roughly they know what they've been trained on. So for the big models that like OpenAI and Gemini and Llama and stuff, that's more or less the entire internet up to some certain point in time. And the other thing that they know is what you feed them uh, as part of that context window. So those are pretty much the two things that we have to work with. So if we want to teach an LLM new things or we want to have an LLM that knows about a context, we could train our own model that's quite expensive and time consuming and probably not the first kind of approach that any of us in this room would uh, start out with. We could fine tune an existing model, meaning taking an existing model and feeding it some extra examples that are kind of relevant to our specific context where we are. That's fairly straightforward, not super expensive, and that's something that you could do. It's uh, probably good if you're in a in, in a, say, a industry where you have some very specific things that it might not have been trained on and you want it to know more about it. But really a super simple way of doing this that costs nothing and that we're going to be working with today is just putting stuff into that context window, just kind of giving it the right information that it needs for answering the question that we have for it. And that's going to just vastly improve the performance uh, when we're talking about something that's custom to, to our interests. So that begs then the question, like if we have hundreds, thousands of documents, like how do we find the right things to put in there if we're not willing to use the whole one and a half million tokens uh, in that window, or if we're using a model that has a much smaller window, how do we find the right things? So I'm going to, and we're going to today be working with an example where we have a kind of hypothetical airline uh, booking system and a uh, assistant that like a customer service assistant for that. So our piece of context information will be a terms of service document. And we're just going to work with a very simple example here. Uh, but the same ideas kind of scale up to as many documents as you might have. Let me <coughs> so the first thing that you want to do is somehow kind of split your documents into reasonable segments. So in my case, I just split by heading basically here. And the second thing that we need to do then is calculate a embedding vector for each. So this vector is not in three dimensions. It's more likely in 1,500 to 3,000 or however many dimensions. And what that vector represents is the semantic meaning of that text. So it doesn't really matter if that text is in English or French or Finnish or Swedish the vector representation of that meaning should still roughly be the same. So this is obviously a little bit weird if you've never run across this, because it's like, how do you take a text and turn it into some mathematical representation? Like, what does that even uh, mean? Again, for us as engineers, there's an API. We can just give it a string, and we get a vector. But it's really kind of good to be able to visualize what's happening. So one way that I've found is has kind of worked for people to explain what <coughs> happened is if we use an analogy of a color picker. So if you've ever used a color picker, you know that you can essentially pick any color on the color spectrum and you get a vector value of red, green, and blue. So a three value vector. And intuitively, you can probably <coughs> understand that if you pick two colors that are very similar to each other, you get vector values of RGB that are very similar to each other. Whereas if you pick two values that are very far away from each other, like say blue and red, those are going to be very different uh, vector values. So essentially, we're trying to do the same thing, but just in like 3,000 <laughs> values and with text. And that's why we need to segment our content in a reasonable way. Because if we, again, this is a very small document and it probably wouldn't matter, but if we were to ask for a vector embedding of the entire document, that would be like asking for the color of an entire image. You could probably get some sort of like mean value and it would maybe kind of say if it's dark or light or whatever, but it wouldn't be very good at like identifying that specific thing that we're interested in. Whereas if we ask like what's the color of the carpet up on the stage here, 
that would already be much more meaningful. So if we can somehow figure out ways of kind of segmenting the text into meaningful chunks, we're going to be able to get much more meaningful uh, embedding vectors that we can search. All right, so we've done this work. We've segmented our text. We've taken each chunk of it and generated uh, vectors by calling an API. We then take those and plop them into a vector store, vector database, essentially. So it's just a database that happens to be good at vector math. Uh, there are extensions to existing databases too, like Postgres, where you can handle uh, vectors very well. So uh, that's a fairly straightforward thing to do. So once you have them there, the interesting part is when somebody asks a question and we want to figure out what is the most relevant piece of information to include in that. And the way we can do that is by taking the question and running it through that same embedding model again. So we're passing it to the same API so we get a vector representation of this question's meaning. So it probably has something to do with cancellation since we're asking about the cancellation policy. We then go to our vector database and ask it for the most similar documents. And we should probably end up getting our cancellation policy part of our document because that also has a meaning that has is somehow kind of related to cancellation. And that's kind of how we can use uh, vector embeddings and a vector database to figure out what are the most relevant pieces of information that are worth putting into our context. All right. Then if we take, again, things one step further to a co-pilot stage, so now we're giving our AI some tools to work with. This essentially looks something like this. So. Uh, try to kind of visualize how the dialogue between us in our application and, and the AI goes. So essentially it means that when we ask a question, we also tell the LLM that, hey, if you need to call some functions, here are a list of different functions that I have available. And the AI will then look at that question and understand that, hey, there's a booking number, like pull up booking. Like I can't do that without first getting information by calling this function. So it'll ask kind of send a response back to our, to our application, asking it to run this function with the given parameters. We'll then do that on our, uh, in our application, in this case on my laptop, and send that answer back to the LLM, which then has all the information to answer that initial question. So essentially we do kind of two trips, uh, two trips there. To the end user, we just kind of get the answer, like the middle parts are, are more or less kind of transparent there. Then finally, before we get to the fun part, which is coding, is just a quick look at uh, the library that we're going to use so we understand what we're looking at. So Hilla is our open source full stack React framework for Spring Boot. So it allows you to essentially just plop React files into a views folder in your Spring Boot app, and they will get displayed there. You can call Java uh, classes directly as RPC methods by adding a browser callable method on them. It comes with a really big library of UI components that you can use. So instead of us starting to kind of piece together things from divs and CSS and stuff, we can say like just use a data grid component and give it a list of objects and be done with it. These are all customizable so we can customize their look and feel by using just some uh, CSS uh, properties, essentially CSS variables that configure things like colors and spacing and roundness and all kinds of uh, factors like that. All these components are available to us as just uh, React components. So if we want to have a text field and a button, we create a text field and a button. If we want to have a grid, we create a grid, pass in an array of contexts and just say which specific paths of that object that we want to have as columns and it'll take care of all the rest of it for us. Like I said, uh, we also handle the routing. So if we, in our front end file, uh, in our front end uh, folder, have a at index file, that's going to be the root of the application. And then any other files that are added there will just get added with their, excuse me, with their file name as the route. What's also special is that we allow you to call Java methods from TypeScript with the same method signature. So if you have a Java class like this and add a browser callable on it, you can call this find all method in TypeScript with the same signature. So the only difference is that it's going to be turned into a asynchronous uh, 
method, so we, we are awaiting the key. The reason is we're going over the network and we don't want to be blocking the UI, so uh, it retains all the type information. It generates all the kind of corresponding type types to whatever you had in Java, so if you change your backend code, you'll get kind of compile time errors in your React code if, uh, if things break. All right, I think that's enough kind of theory for us to get started. I hope we're kind of all on a good enough common understanding of what we're trying to do. So what I want to build today together with you is this application here. So on the right hand side, we have kind of a live view into our database, our hypothetical database of bookings. And then on the left hand side, we have our chat with our, uh, with our AI. And the idea is that whenever we talk to the AI, if it changes anything in the database, that's going to immediately get shown there. Good. So um, let's go into our code here. And uh, can I get a thumbs up from somebody in the back if you can see the code? If you're OK. Yeah. One bigger. One bigger? OK. Yeah, one bigger. <coughs> It's always good to check this, <laughs> like at this point, and not like halfway through it. It's yeah. like, <laughs> could you go back and show me that like first 15 minutes of your code? <laughs> 175. All right, this is gonna be wild. Love that. Thank you. There's some space here, guys. If you want to come in and sit down. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Come on through. Be, be careful with the uh, HDMI cord here. Yeah. Now it's three bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I have a starting point application for us because not everything here is relevant to what we're trying to do, and I just want to save some time. So first of all, uh, the application that we're in is a Spring Boot application. As you said, it's already outdated, so thanks for that. I <laughs> need to go and update it. Uh, I've defined some properties for the Vaadin version, so I'm, right now we have a new major coming out, so I'm testing that with the alpha, and that's what allows me to do all this uh, cool stuff with the file-based routing that I was talking about. Uh, I've added a couple of dependencies. So Vaadin Spring Boot Starter, that allows me to add those React views and call my backend type safely. I've uh, added Langchain here. So I have specifically the Langchain for J Spring Boot Starter, the Langchain for J OpenAI Spring Boot Starter. So if we wanted to use a different model, we would use a different model starter here and every thing else in our code would stay the same, but it would just switch the model for us. And then I pull in this kind of embedding model that runs on my computer. Again, the embedding model is what takes a string and gives us a vector representation of its meaning. So this is just a very simple model that's good for our demo. Uh, I wanted to keep everything as self-contained as possible so that if you think this is cool and you check out the GitHub repo later on, you don't need to have like eight different API keys that you you have to set up when you try to run this. So, so, uh, so that embedding model runs on, on your computer? Yeah. Thanks. Nice. Yeah. I will, uh, I will, like I said, I will share the link right after this. And, uh, and yeah. Oh, yeah, one, one more thing. So I, I'm using Spring Boot DevTools here. So that way, when I build the app, the bot is going to pick up that change and automatically reload the browser for us. So hopefully giving us a little bit more of a nice developer experience there. If we look at the source folder here, uh, the application properties has a couple of relevant things for us. So I've defined my open AI key here uh, for Langchain for J. Specifically, I'm using the streaming chat model. So if you've used chat GPT, you know, it kind of writes out the text as, as it's going along. That's nice for user experience, if, because if we're asking a difficult question, or not difficult question, but a question that has a very long answer. Otherwise, our UI would just be kind of stuck in limbo for 20 seconds, 30 seconds, however long that takes to get generated, and it doesn't really uh, look that great. So we're, we want to stream things as, as they're coming along. And then I'm deciding uh, which model I, I want to use. In our Java folder, we have our Spring Boot application. We have a service package here where we have a flight service. So this is what I'm using to fetch information about all those flight bookings. That's plain spring stuff. I'm not going to spend time on that. Our data model looks like this. So we have bookings and customers. And then we have some enums for things like booking class and booking data and, and so on. 
Then for accessing things uh, from our client, we have this uh, two services. So one is a assistant service. So this is where we're gonna actually hook up our AI model. Right now, it just returns one method or it exposes one method, chat, which returns a flux of strings. A flux is essentially something we can subscribe to on the client. And as, as we push more data onto that flux, we can then consume that on the client and, and display it. Right now, uh, if we, were to run this, it's gonna say, hello there, my brain's not yet hooked up. So we just have some static text here. We're gonna uh, <coughs> replace that. Booking service is super trivial. It just use the, uses that flight service to fetch all the bookings that we have so that we can display them. The UI, if we look at it, um, again, probably need to bump that up too if, to get a similarly big font size there. So you can see we have this kind of split panel here. We have a grid on one side. Then we have a list of messages and a message input here. So the way this looks in code is if we go into the front end folder, views, and our index here, <coughs> you'll see that we have a React component. Don't worry if you're not familiar with React. Essentially, a React component is a JavaScript function that has two main parts, so it has some state, which defines the state of the component. And then we have a template, which uses that state. Whenever the state changes, the template gets automatically re-rendered. So we can see we're using a split layout here to have that draggable thing. We use a message list and a message input for those. We have a grid that's tied to our bookings and that displays all of those. When we call submit here, what happens is that we first of all set a working state to true so that I've uh, hooked up here to disable the input so we don't accidentally try to send multiple queries at once. And then we call assistant service.chat. So again, that's exactly the same signature as we have here. And we subscribe to the next token that comes along. The way I made this work is that whenever we submit, we initially right away show our own message. So we see there's some immediate response to us doing an action. Then when the first token gets generated, so the first word or kind of part of a word, we add a message from the assistant. And then as more stuff comes along, we just append that to the last message. So if we look at how this works, if we say, hey, here, you'll see that it kind of took a little while for the assistant to answer that first token. And then as, as it kind of completed that, we got the rest of the text there. OK, so that's the walkthrough of our starting point. The first thing that we want to do then is define an interface of how do we want to communicate with this AI of ours. So for that, I'm going to go here and I'm going to define an interface called assistant. And I'm going to annotate this with an AI service. So this is Langchain for J stuff right now. So if you've used Spring Data, you know you can define a JPA repository interface, and Spring Data is going to give you an when you auto wired that somewhere, you're going to get like a pre-populated working instance of that. So same idea here. We define the interface that we want to have when interacting with our AI. Langchain for J is going to actually provide that for us. So what I want to have then is if we, again, look at our assistant service, we have a method here where we take in a chat ID. The idea here being that like your chat and my chat will have different IDs and that way our histories don't get uh, mixed up. And the other thing is a user message. So I'm just going to have the same API here. The only difference is, is that I will have a token stream as the return value. So this is a stream of those tokens that the LLM generates. So this will have a string of chat ID and a string of uh, user <coughs> message like this. And this should, of course, have been an interface, like I said. So I, I forgot to mention that I'm horribly jet lagged at this moment. So if I do anything that seems really weird, just do understand that you're all coding this with me. And I expect you to be able to jump in at any moment and, and save me. OK, so we have this uh, token stream. Right now, there is no support in the Spring Boot version of Langchain4j to just return a flux directly. So we need to do a little bit of plumbing work here. I did talk to the 
maintainer of the project and he said that he's going to add that support at some point, but that's not today, so we're going to do it manually. The way we can do that is by using a sync. So we can have a sync is essentially a programmatic way of creating a, a flux. So we have a sync that's going to emit string values. And let me hide this sidebar so we can actually see what's going on here. I'll type this out and then I'll explain um, what I'm doing. All right. So we essentially have a sync that's going to receive many values. So many tokens are going to go through it. It's all going to go to one person, the person who called us. And if there's back pressure, so if we're generating more tokens that the client's able to receive, we should buffer those. We should not drop words from the middle <laughs> of a sentence, for instance, because that would be super unhelpful for what we're trying to achieve here. And then we can return the sync as a flux. So in, in between here, we need to actually call our assistant and uh, hook it up. So first of all, of course, we need that assistant. So we're going to do a private final assistant here like this. We're going to create a constructor where we get it injected. So this is a spring bean, so we can inject things in here. And then we can call our assistant here, pass in our chat ID and our user message that we get from the client. And then both of these have essentially the exact same API. So we can just say that the token streams on next should map to our syncs uh, try emit next. The uh, on complete should map to the this actually fires and has an event, so we need to do uh, sync dot try emit. Why did I call this syncs? All right, try emit complete. All right, and then finally, if there's an error, we're gonna try emit an error like this. And then the piece that I always forget is to call start to actually fire away that. Uh, all right, thank you. Gold star for you. <laughs> Take note. Yeah, this is this is what to expect from me. Like I've done this, yeah, yeah. I've done this talk. Like this is my fourth fourth one this week. So I'm like <laughs> yeah. So what I'm gonna do then is I'm gonna build the project uh, that's gonna get uh, Spring Boot Dev Tools to pick up that change and button is already hooked up to actually auto reload whenever that happens. So we can see that that happened here. And if we now say something like, Hey, it should hopefully answer back. Maybe no. Okay. Let's see what's going on. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. So I, forgot to annotate these. So we can, we want to say that this is our memory ID. So that's going to be the key for the memory map. And this is going to be the user message. All right. These are Langchain specific annotations. Okay, so let's try this again. Hey, all right. Hello, how can I help you today? So this is not the canned response we had before. So we can ask it, who are you? And we should get some sort of information about who's on the other end of this. So <laughs> we are now talking to OpenAI. Now, of course, this is the correct answer, but it's also not the answer that we're expecting <laughs> in our context. Because in our case, this should not be an OpenAI, uh, AI, but it should be our customer service assistant. So we need to give it that system prompt saying instructions on who it is and how it should behave. So let's go ahead. Before you're paying by token. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so okay. there's it's usually input tokens are built differently from output tokens. Input tokens tend to be cheaper than generation tokens. So uh, the long message, the long way to the answer is costing you dollars. Well, let's say <laughs> fractions of a cent. <laughs> but yeah. To the tune of like 10 or minus 4 oh, yeah, okay. of a cent. Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's do a system message here. I already created a prompt for us, so we'll go through that. So what we're going to say is that you're a customer chat support agent for an airline called Funair. I'm from Finland. Our national airline is Finnair. So this is a more fun version of that. Um, 
So it should respond friendly, helpful, and joyful manner before providing information about uh, booking or canceling. It should always get booking number, first name, last name. Before changing a booking, it should make sure that that's permitted by our terms. We're going to get back to those. And if there are charges, uh, we should ask for consent before proceeding. And we're going to also inject today's date because, again, the generic LLM doesn't know what date is it, it is otherwise. So you could put in that prompt, if you're talking to Sean, respond in 50 words or less. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I did get some feedback that this is not very realistic for a customer support agent, so it should probably be like sarcastic <laughs> and <laughs> angry, angry manner would probably be more passive aggressive manner would be like more realistic, but let's go with this for now. So uh, we're going to go into our app here. I'm going to say, hey, who are you? And we should be able to see that it now has gained some <laughs> understanding of who it is. Very good. Um, there's a little problem here uh, still, so I'm going to see if the dictation works here, even though it's a little noisy, but it just saves me a lot of time from typing. So, hi, my name is Marcus. So if I give it a piece of information uh, and then try to reference that information again later on, so say, What's my name again? I seem to have forgotten it. <laughs> we'll see what it says. <laughs> 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 so again, it's trying to be helpful like we instructed. It's like, well, we can probably figure this out together if we <laughs> get your booking <laughs> details and we can <laughs> look it up. But obviously, it should have understood this from our previous conversation. So let's go ahead and sort that out. So I'm going to go into my ID. We're going to create a new configuration class here. I'm going to call this my langchain for j config. And we're going to hide that sidebar again so we have some room to work with. This is going to be a configuration class. And the first bean that I'm going to configure here is going to be a chat memory provider. So if we define beans uh, like this and Whenever LangChain starts up, it'll find it. And it's like, oh, there's a chat memory provider, so I'll go ahead and use that. So we're going to return here a function that takes in as the input the chat ID that we kind of passed in, and then it'll return a let's do a token window chat memory with say a thousand tokens. I don't know. That's probably excessively much for what we need here, but uh, it'll be fine. And you can see that it wants in as a second parameter a tokenizer. So each model will tokenize things slightly differently. So we need to have something that's able to look at a string and say, how many tokens will this be for the specific model that we're using? We can inject that by just auto wiring in a tokenizer here. So whatever model we're using, Langchain is going to have that on the class path for us. So we'll say tokenizer, tokenizer like that, build this. Let's go back and see how our Frankenstein's doing. <coughs> All right. Hey, my name is Marcus. What's my name? I seem to have forgotten it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so good. We're uh, <laughs> we're getting somewhere here. So now that we defined how we want to manage that memory, it's going to take care of it. So essentially, what this Token window chat memory means that it's going to keep up to a thousand tokens worth and then it's going to start dropping older messages. Now, you could provide your own implementation that could be smarter. It could, I don't know, summarize the conversation up until a point or whatever so you can have much longer memory than uh, you would otherwise have. But for what we're doing right here, this is a, a good starting point. Now, we still have a problem here. So if we ask this, uh, assistant now that knows it's a assistant for our fun air airline if we ask it something that's specific to our business like the cancellation policy hey can you explain the cancellation policy to me please we're gonna get an interesting answer here all right so yeah mm -hmm. so it it's giving us a really credible sounding answer that's probably like a good aggregate of all the cancellation policies for all the airlines <laughs> in the world 
<laughs> but, but also it has almost nothing to do with the actual cancellation policy that we have defined in our terms of service that says that you can cancel up to 48 hours before and there are some different fees depending on your class of flight and so on. So again, it's trying to be super helpful, but because it doesn't know it's not being super helpful. So the next thing we want to do is walk through those same steps that we did in the slides. So essentially taking a document, split it into sections, turn each section in, into embeddings, put it in a vector store and then make that available. So this is going to be a little bit more coding before we get to the next running point. So stay awake. We need to work on this together. First thing that we're going to define <coughs> is a embedding model. So this is what takes a string, gives us a vector. For this, we're going to use that uh, all mini um, uh, new all mini LM embedding model. Then we want to have a vector store, so a vector database where we're going to store things. Embedding, embedding store, and this specific one is going to contain text segments because we're working with text, and we're going to call this our embedding store. Come on, all right. So here we're going to return a new in-memory embedding store. Again, this is just in-memory. You could hook this up to whatever actual database you have in real life. Since these are interfaces, it's not going to change the the way our application works. Okay, so now that we have these two things, the next thing we need to do is, of course, somehow read in our document. In a real-life application, you wouldn't really be ingesting the documents in the same application where you're consuming them, most likely, because that would just be unnecessary work when you're starting up. Rather, you probably have a build server somewhere. Uh, for instance, I did this for our documentation. Whenever one documentation page gets changed, then we can just rerun the embeddings for that specific page. And so, but to have a self-contained demo, we're just going to inline it right here. So we're going to create an application uh, runner, and we're going to call this our ingest docs method. This needs to return a method that takes in arguments, and we need some things passed into us here. So we need that embedding model so that we can take those segments and turn them into into vectors. We need that embedding store so we have somewhere to put them. Then we need a tokenizer so that we know how long those segments are. So we, we're going to aim for a certain size. And then we need a resource loader so we can load stuff from the class path. OK, so I'm going to start by just getting handled to the actual resource from my class path. So I'm going to use the loader to get a resource from my class path terms of, of service.txt. Then when we have that, we can load that into a lang chain for j document. So we're going to call this our doc. Load document. So lang chain for j comes with a bunch of different loaders built in. So this is a file st system document loader uh, for loading documents. And this takes in a path and a parser. So we're going to pass in first the path by getting the file path from that resource. And then we're going to give a new text document parser. Now, they just recently came out with a convenience uh, parser that just takes in a folder and looks at all the endings and tries to apply the right parser to everything that you have in there. Probably really good for demos, but I wanted to literally walk through the exact same things as we had in our in our uh, slides so that we don't kind of miss out on the actual learnings here. Uh, so then we're going to create a ingester, ingester like this. So that's going to be what actually ingests all these documents. Here it's going to use a builder pattern that langchain for j seems to like very much. So there are a lot of builders there. We can configure the model first of all to be our embedding model. We need to have the store to be our store. Then we need to have a splitter, which splits documents based on something. We're going to use a recursive splitter, again, that we can import. So that, again, is from document splitters.recursive. This takes in a few parameters. So it says what's our maximum segment size that we want, ideally, for 
our segments, what's the overlap in size. So sometimes, depending on what type of content you're working with, it might sen make sense to have a little bit of overlap so you don't cut some important thing right in the middle and miss out on it. And then you need to have that tokenizer so it knows how to count tokens. So in my case, I happen to know the right answer is 50, zero and tokenizer. But this is very much an engineering problem where you can try out different things. Uh, so for instance, when I did this for a documentation, I could leverage the fact that it was ASCII doc and it has headings and I could kind of figure out anything under a heading is probably kind of roughly around the same, same thing. So I could leverage that. But for more generic text, you probably want to use something like the recursive splitter where it tries to first fit like an entire paragraph into that amount of tokens. If it doesn't, then it'll start splitting by by um, sentences and, and so on and so forth. And once we have our ingester created, we could ingest as many documents as we possibly want. We only have one document, so that's all we're going to do. But if you had 100 documents, 1,000 documents, it would work exactly the same. So again, just to reiterate, this would not be in this application in a real life situation. It would be somewhere else. So what we need to defined for actual running application is a content retriever, which is what knows how to retrieve content from an embedding store. So we're going to call this our content retriever. We need to inject two things. So again, we need that embedding model because we need to take the incoming question and turn it into a vector so that we can match it to things that we have in our embedding store. Embedding store like this. And here we're just going to return a Let's see, embedding store content retriever. It's a builder. We'll close that out. Again, we're going to first put the embedding model here, the embedding store. And then we can define things like I want at most two results. They should have at least a 0.6 relevancy score. Uh, this goes from 0 to 1. You uh, probably want to have some minimum limit to your relevancy score because otherwise it will like even for completely unrelated things to our terms of service it would still try to add some kind of document as context for that answer and that might sometimes confuse the LLM to go on side paths <laughs> and uh, answer something else. Um, all right, very good. Anyone curious to see if this actually worked? Uh, so if we build that, we go back into our app here, see if that gets reloaded. Yep. All right, so if things went well, we should be able to ask it now about our cancellation policy, and we should be able to get something that resembles what we had in that text document. Can you explain the cancellation policy for me, please? All right, so, all right, so it's 48 hours before, correct? Okay, and now we're getting all those fees that we had defined in our text. So this is now, <coughs> grounded in our actual reality of our our business so now we now we're talking like now this is getting somewhere so if if all we wanted to do was create some chat bot that helps people with documents in your uh, in your uh, organization or something like we could pretty much call it a day here uh, yes yeah Maybe I, 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 yeah, I don't. Usually, like for a small document like that, is it like really? It it's usually really quick. I I don't. Uh, yeah, I I don't know how. Like of course, doing it in memory on my computer or like on the device here is probably less efficient than calling a model. Like these uh, embedding models are dirt cheap to to run, so it probably doesn't even make sense for me to <coughs> be doing this on my computer anyway. But but, but anyway, so we have a good start here. The next thing that we want to do, so we're essentially now, if we followed along this, this uh, continuum from a chatbot first, where we gave it some memory, so it remembered what we were talking about. Then we ingested some docs. We got to this retrieval augmented generation where it, it was able to retrieve documents and stuff to, to kind of uh, <coughs> ground itself in our reality. The next step then is to go to Copilot and define some actual tools for it to use so that it can perform some things. So 
what I want to do is I want to define three tools, one for just fetching bookings, one for canceling bookings, of course those should be subject to our terms of service, and finally one for just updating uh, a booking. So let's go into our ID again, and we're going to create a new class here, so this, let's call this our booking tools. And this is going to be a spring component, so it gets picked up. And then here I'm going to, first of all, inject that uh, flight service that I have, so we can actually fetch those things for our, our database. Uh, private final flight service, flight service, like this. All right, so the first thing that I'm going to do is a public booking details. So booking details is a record that contains all the information about a booking. It's the same thing that we have listed here in the in the grid. So we have some a method that returns that. It's going to have a name of get booking details. And if you remember, we told it that we should also get the booking number, the first name, and the last name before doing things. So that's what my API is going to be. It's going to have a string booking number number string first name string oh come on string last name like that I'm gonna turn on copilot here just to kind of save us from watching me type all of this um, so we have one for getting booking details yep so that did not work let's see okay so that's gonna be a Void, yeah, and then we want to have one for changing bookings. It didn't quite guess the API correctly, so this takes actually in booking number, first name, last name, new date, from and to, so we can change all of those things. So I'm just gonna change that to match here, and I could theoretically just allow it to call those methods directly in my flight service, but I'm I want to just have them here instead. So the way I make these now available to Langchain is by adding a tool annotation on the methods that I want to make available like this. We could could add some extra information to tell the LLM more about these methods, but I tried to be very descriptive in the naming of both the methods and the bookings here, so that should hopefully take care of it. So if we now go ahead and build this, we should be able to play around with these. So the way I built out the test data is that the beginning of the test data set here is way too close to their flight to actually be able to cancel or change them, whereas people here towards the end are able to do it. So let's start with pretending to be John Doe. Hi, I'm John Doe. Can you please pull up my booking details? All right. So. Again, I forgot to get my booking number, so it's going to prompt me to give some more information. It's 101. All right, so let's see what happens. All right, so it's pulling up a booking details. So it's San Jose to Frankfurt. Yeah, that looks pretty correct. So let's see. Please cancel my booking. So. Again, this should hopefully not work. Yeah, so it's saying that unable to do that because we are within that 48 hour window before our flight, so <coughs> no go, no, no dice, uh, not gonna happen. So let's try a different one. So now we are Robert Taylor and uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Robert Taylor. My booking number is 105. I would like to change my flight to Toronto instead. I hear it's really beautiful this year, time of year. <laughs> okay, so it's uh, just confirming if I want to do it on a different day. The same day, please. All right. So it's uh, saying that since we're in business, it's free of charge. I, I didn't 
obviously if this was in real life like the there would be a fair difference and stuff but that's kind of beside the point of this demo but so it's just confirming that I really do want to go to Toronto it's like why okay yes so let's see if that happens and sure enough we can see it updating here Is it part of API or it's part of essentially model, open AI trained on that? So there, there are two levels here. One is, one is the terms of service, since it knows what's in here. It's going to look at the date of today, the date of our uh, trip, and then it's going to see if it's 48 hours before. Of course, in my flight service, I have literally in Java written business rules that check that all of these things are true when it tries to do it because I don't trust the <laughs> AI enough. Like if I were to change this to GPT 3.5 Turbo, it will happily just do whatever it feels <laughs> like doing. It's just like, <laughs> no, no worries. It'll just try to do all kinds of stuff. Uh, if it does try to do something and it, the uh, method invocation throws an exception where, where I, for instance, say like you can't do that, all of that gets transparently handled and then it's like, ooh, I couldn't do that. And then it just casually mentions like, oh, no, I can't do that. So even though it tried to do it, it catches itself and really acts cool. And <laughs> are you adding in the, are you in the system message a retry? Don't you try read three times if you cannot find a content? No, I haven't added anything like that. How can we make sure that it's not hallucinating some of its ideas into the, <coughs> into the policies that we've provided? Yeah, I mean, reducing hallucinations, you can certainly try to do it as much as possible within the system prompt and by like prompting it, but like 100% reducing it is very difficult. I don't know if you uh, Dan have any any tips on completely eliminating hallucinations. <laughs> well, if you reduce the temperature to zero, and then but then it will want to do as much as exact matches as it can. Yeah. But you have no recourse in case if it doesn't find anything. If you retry, it's like uh, you're retrying with the same data, so it will yeah. fail as many times as yeah. you retry. Yeah. So you might uh, be able to reduce the temperature parameter for calling the model, but that has other problems then. Hey, can you feed exceptions into the model to like get it to give better messages when it fails? Like for the tools? Yeah, so the tools could throw exceptions with like a message and that it would take that into account. And the model would read those? Yeah. Okay, nice. Yeah. I know, I know. I, I've, <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've given a, a warning since I know I'm in Canada. Like you've literally already been in trouble for this. So I like, no, nobody get the idea of putting chat this in. Chatbot was doing its own thing. It knew what it was doing. It's it the fault of the chatbot, not the airline. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, like this is only for informational purposes and so on and so forth. <laughs> Anyway, um, all right, so let's see. Actually, it turns out that it's pretty cold there, so I'll uh, cancel my trip. <laughs> all right, um, so that was what I wanted to show you. If you want to play around with this specific thing, you can find it up on my GitHub. Uh, I have a separate branch there for the same app in Spring AI. I just today got a contribution from somebody on the Semantic Kernel team, the Semantic Kernel version mm -hmm. of it. And uh, it's been really nice because I've literally gotten help from the langchain for j team and the Spring AI team and now the Semantic Kernel team and putting together this kind of semi-realistic app uh, that showcases kind of the different and similarities and the kind of top AI libraries in the Java space. So I think it's, uh, uh, that's pretty cool. What have you used for the, uh, the, for the uh, voice input? What, what I'm using for the voice input? Just the <coughs> Mac built-in oh. F5 button here. <coughs> yeah, it's magic. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks so much for coming. Um,
It was super great seeing you.